Welcome to Method Ministries. Tonight we are joined by a very, very special guest that I'm super excited about. It's John Harris from Conversations That Matter. And the reason why I'm really excited about this episode tonight, because um, I asked John to come on here. That way he can tell us on top of who he is, what he does, his ministry, and how we can help him about the social justice gospel. As you guys know, or if you if you do know, you've been following me on YouTube and social media. I talk a lot about this and I try to make it aware to people what's going on because it's dominant. It's in the evangelical church and is being taught by a lot of evangelical leaders and, 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 and even pastors and teachers and famous men as well. So with that being said, uh, John Harris, thank you so much for being here and welcome. My pleasure. I appreciate you having me on, Lucas, and uh, looking forward to getting into things. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, so why don't you go ahead for our viewers, you know, tell us who you are, what you do, and anything else you want to mention. The floor is yours. Yeah, so I, oh man, um, <laughs> <laughs> for those who watch me online, you know me probably, or if you've heard of me at all, it's in relationship to books I've written on social justice, or it's my podcast, Conversations That Matter. And then I talk about um, a lot of different topics, but mostly uh, social justice and evangelical circles and where it's making inroads. And uh, so that's kind of the gist of it. You can go to worldviewconversation.com and you can find out more. I also um, help make some documentary films. I guess I'm a producer with Last Stand Studios. And you can go to laststandstudios.org. One of our new projects that we're doing is called American, um, or rather, uh, six, the 1607 Project. Nice. Uh, I confuse it with another one. But yeah, that's <laughs> the one we're working on now, 1607. And we have a website for that, too, 1607project.com. And uh, and yeah, I mean, I'm involved with my church. I'm you know just a regular guy, but uh, I like hobbies. Uh, I like uh, cycling and hiking and fishing and hunting and all kinds of things. But uh, that's probably what most people know me for. And that's where I've put a lot of time in the last, I, I would say three years since I graduated from grad school. Awesome. And speaking of your books, I, I have both of them here. So, cause oh, you know, cool. you know, our viewers, yeah. John Harris is two, two books, Christianity, social justice, and then social justice goes to church. Great, great guys, great books. Get these books. These, these books are so important. I, um, I hand them out to people and I try to tell as much people as I can, because I said, it's, you know, the social justice gospel, it's alive and well. So it's important that we try to, you know, again, make people aware of it. So John, thank you for these two books. These are really helpful. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you enjoy them. Yeah, definitely. Um, I remember the beginning, it was like 2020 when everything started getting hot and heavy with all this. Right. And, you know, uh, I was looking into it and trying to figure out like, man, like what, what is going on with everybody's jumping on board with like white privilege, you know, what maybe we'll talk about or systemic racism. And you were one of the guys that I found that were saying, and, you know, aware of what was going on, because I was thinking to myself, man, am I crazy? Am I the only one who's, who's, who's hearing this, who's seeing this and watching everybody just fall, falling along, like no questions asked. And you were one of the few at the time that, that was getting, you know, just bringing that clarity to me. Where I was like, OK, I'm not the only one seeing this. There are Christians out here who are, again, aware and trying to fight back. Yeah. Yeah, it was a lonely road a little bit because there weren't um, a lot of people that were saying anything to push back, especially at the higher levels. It seemed like it was a relationship where the higher you went, the less someone would say about it. And I just saw a need and started talking about it. And I wasn't really anyone of noteworthiness at the time. And it just started getting viral. People were sharing my stuff around and it fulfilled the need that people had. And so um, I'm grateful for that. It's costed me some, but it's, I think, been more rewarding than anything it's costed me because, mm. you know, taking a principled stand on issues that do matter is it's something that we all are going to face at some point in our life, a choice as to whether or not we do that. And um, I, I think 2020 especially, and, and for me, it was right before 2020 when I started to notice these things. And so I, I guess I was on the ground floor. But if you're not going to take a stand in 2020, if that's not the time or the moment, then I don't know when you would. Right. Mm, yeah. And um, and so I think it's exposed a lot of failure in leadership. But it's also, I think, given credibility to some newer voices that um, are, are probably in need of more platforming, but they're at least there's at least some hope out there. There's at least some, uh, we, we know what we're dealing with now and we know that there's some courageous voices and that have been tested. And so the few voices that did stand strong, I have a lot more faith in it at this point. And, that, and so that's the encouraging thing for me. 
Definitely. Yeah. And and there's a new fault line too. you know, to quote uh, Bodie Bauckham's book, which is a great book too on the subject. There's a new fault line. Yeah. 2020. And, you know, it, it's interesting because it's, it's no longer enough to just find out, okay, does somebody affirm the fundamentals? Now you got to find out, do you stop there? Or do you, and do you continue to add things like social justice, white privilege, systemic racism? And those are almost like, the, you know, again, like the things I kind of just want to automatically go to when I try to find a church, a pastor or figure out, okay, is this teacher solid or not? I want to find out, does he take a stand on these issues? And has he taken a stand or has he caved and is he still going along with all these things? Yeah, yeah. That's important to find out whether or not your pastor or, your, you know, whatever spiritual leadership you have is going to face this issue and um, and not try to take two positions like Tim Keller does or yeah. uh, try to uh, muddy the water so they don't really have to take a stand. If you're not going to defend the sheep when the sheep are being attacked, then you really have no business being a shepherd, right? Yeah, man. So, and even yeah. us as Christians too, you know, it's important that we stand. You know, even if we're not pastors, if we're just laymen, you know, it's important that if if we haven't taken a stand just to determine it within ourselves, okay, if this continues on, if I see it again, I'm going to say something. I'm going to do something. I'm going to fight for the kingdom of God. Amen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, totally agree with you. By the way, guys, uh, just to mention too to my audience, uh, John Harris, and you know, I got his permission, you know, to, uh, to ask for prayers for this. His YouTube channel just got um, a hit, right? Like a week's penalty. Yeah, I, I can't right now. I can't post anything for a week on YouTube. Yeah, so, that's ridiculous. Uh, I had a guest on who talked about the Brazilian election, the presidential election, mm -hmm. and um, we were being careful, but I guess not careful enough. And the YouTube algorithms i guess have been directed to cancel anyone or, or huh. strike anyone who uh, might say that the election wasn't above board so it wow. feels a little dystopian to me but um, it's not the first time this has happened once before on uh, covid related stuff and so i'll just say that much because i don't want to say any more to get you in trouble <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah uh, do you have a rumble by chance I do. Yeah. But okay. it's only got a little over 2000 subscribers compared to the YouTube channel, which has like 35,000. So it, I mean, you know, it's a small percentage of the audience that yeah. would see it if I just posted exclusively on rumble, but I do use rumble uh, just for things like this in case I get totally shut down on YouTube. Okay. And I at least have another place where the content uh, where I'm putting the content. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, so, uh, you know, uh, you got our prayers, you know, we'll pray for you and thank you guys you. can follow him on rumble because rumble's the, probably the future maybe for going forward. looks like. Yeah. Rumble or any of the audio formats as well, like iTunes, they haven't, they're not as uh, big on policing that stuff at, at this yeah. point at least, which is good. Gotcha. All right. So you, you, I just get into the interview. So we really want to talk about social justice in particular, not just like social justice, but the social justice gospel. So if right. you can explain to us what the social justice gospel is for our, our viewers. Yeah. So, I mean, we could get lost in terminology and that's what I don't want to do because um, <laughs> there's a lot of terms floating around out there. Social gospel is a term from about a hundred years ago that was used by most notably Walter Rauschenbusch to designate a, uh, a view that, he and others had who were impacted by what's called Fabian socialism. Fabian socialism is a iteration of socialism in Great Britain that instead of seeking a, an immediate revolution, the Fabians thought that over time society would gradually adopt socialism and they could march through the institutions, so to speak. So um, Walter Rauschenbusch liked this idea when he visited England and he came back and in the United States, they didn't really, uh, want socialism because they associated it with atheism and immorality. Mm. And so in order to get people who thought of themselves as Christians to adopt this, he had to call it something else. So he used the term social justice. Uh, but he also officially, I would say, as historians have written about it, um, they have remembered his ideas more under the banner of social gospel. And, uh, and he used that term as well. And really, it's an application of the gospel to society. That's on its best day. That's what they want you to think this is. Mm. And so it's not just about saving individual souls of uh, be from an eternity in God's uh, under God's wrath. It's also about attempting to make the world a better place by 
feeding the hungry, right? And doing these charitable endeavors. So that was that was social justice and, and social gospel about a hundred years ago. Well, fast forward today, we have a version of this and it, it is the same kind of thing. It's the same yeah. basic uh, framework, but it's been developed quite a bit by things that have happened in between then and now. We have a hundred years of development with critical theory, with uh, postmodernism, critical race theory now, the Me Too movement, and, and all these other things that have become popular over the last few years. And they've all kind of coalesced into this uh, social justice movement that we see today. And the when Christians want to look at this movement that's happening out there, this movement in the world, and then fuse, just like Walter Rauschenbusch wanted to fuse Fabian socialism with Christianity, they want to fuse with this movement, their Christianity, they end up perverting the gospel, just like Walter Rauschenbusch did. And so they create a gospel that is really a works righteousness gospel. You have yeah. to engage in certain political activities or at least hold certain political views or social views in order to actually have some righteousness. And it's not um, the righteousness of Christ that saves you. It's, it's really just like the Judaizer heresy in Galatians. It's the grace of God plus something else. And in this case, it's plus pursuit of some kind of a social justice um, related uh, agenda. So uh, there's many examples of this. One of the ones that I use in the book is um, a, an article that uh, Paul David Tripp wrote in 2018, I want to say, after a conference called the MLK 50. Hmm. And he said he never understood the gospel until he went there. And that we need to be about the gospel of God's justice, not just the gospel of, of God's grace. Yeah. And so and I have many more quotations along these same lines from very popular evangelicals. But that one's a very obvious one to me that, you know, the gospel, God's justice is not good news. It's not gospel. It's not grace. It's it's actually the thing that condemns us. His justice is something as a sinner we want to try to get away from somehow. Right. Hmm. And so to say the good news of God's justice doesn't make a whole lot of sense if you're talking about soteriology. Um, it, I mean, it, it's good news that God is a just God, I, I suppose you could say that, but that's not the gospel. That's not what we're talking about when we talk about uh, the justification, sanctification, glorification in scripture. So it, this isn't um, the, the good news is that God has made a way for us to be forgiven. He's taken our sins and it's all about his work, not our work. The social justice gospel makes it all about our work and what we do to get into God's good favor. And so we have to do something. We have to be a certain way and plus, you know, accepting God's free offer in order to actually be thought of as an, a legitimate or an authentic Christian. And this is really nothing different than any other works righteousness system that all the, the cults do the same thing. They'll say that they believe in grace through faith. But when you already when you start like asking them about the details, you'll start to figure out, OK, you know, for the Mormons, it's uh, it, it's we're saved by grace. After all, we can do it's um, we have to have a proper baptism and a proper um, uh, authority um, activating that baptism. We have to have uh, a membership in their church. We have to have all these other things that are these barriers uh, to receiving God's grace and. That's the same thing the social justice movement does. And so it's putting burdens on people that don't need to be there. Uh, they're unnecessary. And that's the main reason I think that I've been motivated to speak out against it. Because if it was just a bad ethic, which it is. Yeah. I mean, I could see myself saying something, but it, I wouldn't be as concerned as uh, the what I see to be eternal ramifications here. That there are people who have legitimately been... Uh, converted to what amounts to a false religion. And I think of social justice as a religion. And so um, there's a spectrum here. It doesn't mean that every pastor who's ever said anything that was social justice related is necessarily in cult land, but you're on the road that leads you there. And uh, it's a political religion. And so we have to be just very discerning and careful about this. And pastors should be warning sheep that, um, it's by grace that we're saved completely. It's it's Christ's work, not ours. Definitely. And and would you agree too that social justice is just 
it is taking something that the world teaches and just filters it through Christianity. So, so, so it starts first, not with the Bible, which is what the world says. And, you know, like maybe a critical race theory idea. And then again, just puts the scriptures through that. So out comes a different scripture, a different gospel. Yeah, it, that it very much is a syncret. It's, um, there's a syncret. I don't know. I can't say the word. It's syncretism. There we go. I'll just say yeah, that. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> it's the, you know, when the children of Israel would merge with these pagan religions, uh, they, they would take elements of their true religion and merge it with the false religion. So they'd go up to the high places, right? And uh, worship God in ways that he was not supposed to be worshiped. And they'd um, worship him along with other false gods. And of course, you know, the, it's false worship. That's the bottom line. But they would have seen it as, uh, in their minds, as something legitimate that, you know, they still can be worshiped. They can keep their, their, their God and their traditions and also adopt these other traditions. And that's what people are doing when they merge social justice with Christianity. They're taking these worldly concepts that are, as Francis Schaeffer said, it's they're really Christian heresies. That's what he said Marxism was. Yeah. So they're taking things that are parallels. They, they have a, a framework that's kind of eerily similar to Christianity, but it's not because there's really no redemption. Um, it's they have their own holy books and their, their own uh, pr oppressed perspectives that are authoritative and infallible. You can't challenge. They have their own saints, uh, police shooting victims. They have, you know, their own um, uh, salvation message in a way, but it doesn't actually save you. It's you get woke and then you do works to try to bring about a, a heavenly state of equity, diversity and inclusion. Hmm. And so it, it, it sounds a little bit like Christianity, like there's parallels there, but it's not Christianity. And uh, I think that's why the two can sometimes dovetail. I think that's why Christians see it as something that, oh, that that's kind of like what we have. And uh, I don't see the difference if they lack discernment. Um, they're going to figure it out if they're true Christians. Eventually, they'll, yeah, they'll see, will. oh, this is not <laughs> at all. Uh, but. Yeah, I mean, this has happened for a long time. Liberation theology is the same thing. You and this was with uh, the Roman Catholic Church, but you so you already had an elements of false religion here, but it was the fusion of Roman Catholicism and Marxism, and you have the same thing with uh, Black liberation theology. A lot of the Black churches in the United States have gone this direction where they've they've merged. Uh, it's a merging of Marxism with their theology. You have. Um, in World War II, uh, during well, and but preceding that, the German Christian movement in Nazi Germany, because they, they were socialists and they tried to merge Lutheranism and Catholicism yeah, with right. Nazism, right? Yeah. This happens. This is just a story of true religion throughout the millennia. There's always been a threat of merging it with something that isn't true and thus making it impure. And uh, so this is just the latest iteration, the latest threat. I recently just had to uh, leave a, a church. It, it, it was an Acts 29 church. Um, you know, I didn't get a chance to talk about that on YouTube. You know, maybe I will. But I was finally done with, with you know, Acts 29. But the pastor there told me that he believes social justice is just an implication of the gospel. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. I've heard this. Yeah, which, you know, which means, you know, as you said, too, because a lot of people think that, okay, social justice, I can just agree to disagree and, you know, we can still be Christians. But I think what people don't realize is that these are primary issues primary doctrines and that's why as you know you pointed out too it's a different religion and and you can hear it come out from these people because they talk about you know these are gospel issues like that's their mantra gospel issues well if if it's a gospel issue that means you and i we have two different gospels over here and i think people Bingo. they don't realize that they they think again this is a, maybe like a calvinist and arminian thing or a baptism you know infant baptism pedo baptism not realizing no 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 this this goes back from secondary to primary doctrines right yeah it's a it's a really watered down very broad gospel and you know this is the interesting thing to me because there are some guys that are even politically conservative more um who have said you know the problem with the gospel co coalition is that they have too narrow of a gospel they, the gospel <laughs> affects every realm it affects uh it should dictate what we do in the political realm and in the arts and in, you know, all these other things. And, you know, the thing is like, 
it sounds nice when you first hear it because oh, we love the gospel, right? And so if you're, you're just trying to apply the gospel to everything, but the, here's the thing about it, though. The gospel has a, a specific meaning in scripture. And if, you know, you could say uh, the Judaizers could have come to Paul and they could have said to him, Paul, uh, getting circumcised is just a gospel implication, right? They could have, yeah. <laughs> you, could have, you could tie a lot of things to that. You could tie almost anything in Christianity to it, it's uh, somehow related to the gospel, but the gospel itself is the power of God to salvation. And it, there's really only, there, there's a one consistent meaning th throughout scripture. Um, and if we broaden that, what we do is we, we water it down. We make it, uh, it, it becomes like a bumper sticker. And I think that's where Gospel Coalition has now gotten in trouble. They call themselves a Gospel Coalition, but look at the content on their website. I mean, yeah. it's not all about the gospel. And, but for years, um, the term gospel issue is being used. They don't use it as much now, I think, because they've been called out so much. But, mm -hmm. You know, gospel centered was the big thing uh, oh, yeah. as well. Like every gospel, you just like put the gospel became like uh, the adjective. Sometimes it just tack <laughs> on to things like we're going to do gospel, this gospel, that. Uh, and it's um, it, it cheapens it, really. It cheapens it. And I think that's what we've uh, we've had happen. And so there's a lot of ignorance on what the gospel actually is. And, and especially that separation of law and grace that. We have law that condemns us and that after we are uh, saved, after we come to a knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and he does a work in our heart, the law becomes a guide for us. But the law is not the gospel right? and the gospel is not the law. The gospel is good news. And it's is it good news to, to come to someone and to say to them, you need to be involved in social justice? Not really. Be, I mean, can we, that's a works thing. Yeah. Are any of us ever going to perfectly do anything, including perfectly execute some kind of a social justice agenda? No, we're no, anything we do is going to fall short of the way Jesus would have done it. Had he been in the same position, we are not perfect beings. We have a sin nature. So nothing, if I came to you with anything and said, uh, you need to do something, you need to do this. It's not good news because you're going to fail in some way. It's going to fall short of God's standard and it's going to end. There's going to end up being sin involved and that will condemn you. Sin condemns and it leads to death. So that can't be the gospel. Uh, and so I get concerned about this. I think we got it. We got to pr protect the gospel as far as uh, the, the concept of the gospel and be very um, careful when we use that term, just like we're careful when we use the name of the Lord. Hopefully we are. Yep. We have to be careful when we use the term gospel so that we're not misinterpreting it or applying to things it shouldn't be applied to. I talked about 2020 in, in the beginning, you know, where this is like hot, hot and heavy and that was waking people up. Would you agree that the social justice gospel is really what we saw in 2020 and not just like the Black Lives Matter in, you know, on, on the news channels in the cities, but in particular, you know, there was a, a really a strong push in the church for this. And there was a really there was a drift and tensions was high. And every sermon was this, you know, racial harmony, racial reconciliation. Oh, tell me about it. Yeah. Diversity and all that. Like, would you agree that that like the social justice gospel, you know, in case people maybe deny it or maybe they don't want to believe it's a gospel. Would you agree that that's what we saw happen in 2020? Uh, that we saw like a, a falling away, you mean like a heretical drift? Yeah. Like what was going on, like with the churches and like every sermon again was just like, Oh yeah. Racism, racism. And like there was well, talk conferences. Yeah. I think it's important to note that the shifts that manifested themselves in 2020 had already taken place actually. And it's not to say some people weren't getting caught up in BLM and changing their mind on some things, but, um, when it came to our leaders at the higher levels of evangelicalism and, and really almost every institution, they had already made up their minds on this issue, I think, to some extent. And I saw this in seminary hmm. that, you know, it was like 2017, I think, when I had a professor tell me, look, if I were to challenge the social justice stuff at Southeastern, I'd be fired. Oh my goodness. And, wow. and you know, this was like a closed door meeting I had with them. 
And he would identify other professors who were against social justice. Since then, I think they've all left or retired or whatever, but um, it's possible maybe a few are still there. I don't know. But, you know, the thing is, there was already a hostile environment to people who would have dissented on this topic. And I think a lot of evangelicals don't realize that they just not, they weren't aware that this had already taken place in the academy and in the seminaries. And it had already taken place in the conference circuits. Um, that's why, you know, the MLK 50 was in 2018. Hmm. Uh, you can look at, you know, cruise conferences, their 2015 conference was completely woke. Uh, Campus Crusade uh, is what they used to be called. The, um, uh, I mean, th I'm trying to think of it because there's some even sort of quote unquote evangelical organizations like InterVarsity that have been woke forever. But, um, but the ones that we don't think of as as woke as much, um, like the Southern Baptists, uh, you know, they were kind of going down, steadily going down this line. I want to say till since like 2010 at least. Wow. If you read like the Great Commission Resurgence, um, th there's a book that got put out on uh, what can we do basically to keep the Southern Baptist Convention from dying? Because it's a bunch of old white men. So how do we how do we keep this from dying? Because that demographic is is going to be gone. And, the, you know, Al Mohler writes about basically we will we will cease to be a denomination unless we do some kind of a diversity thing. And so the colleges started offering diversity scholarships and things like this. They started adopting basically the same logic that someone would adopt to uh, hmm. apply like a affirmative action or something like that. And you could say that there was a noble intention, maybe, you know, they want to keep from dying. But the, the, the irony is that they're dying because they've adopted this to some extent um, and, and more than that. But you know, the thing about it is they at that moment decided we're going to step outside of the mission or the the tools that God has given us in his word. And we're going to try something that the world does to see if we can attract people hmm. to our seminaries and churches. And and so this has kind of been going on for actually decades, even though. We're, we've been unaware of it in, in some ways. It, it just took a little while to distill, I think, to our churches. And 2020 was the moment where uh, first first right after Trump's election and then 2020 were like the two times when everyone was like, let's go. Like, let's let's really push this hard. Yeah. And uh, so I, I think that um, those changes had already been taken root. And 2020 was just the manifestation of it. And that's when a lot of laymen who were unaware of some of this were surprised and just, you know, they had never heard anything like this from their pastor. Well, their pastor has been reading people, you know, for years and going to <laughs> conferences and getting immersed in this. And that was the opportunity for him to start saying, this is what I've learned. Yeah. Cause uh, it's interesting that, you know, how you mentioned that, cause go, going back, like, you know, when I try to investigate the origins of this is you can see and hear, you know, them talk about things like, well, they drop hints. Like, that, like John Piper talked about racial harmony, you know, uh, you know, you quote like Matt Chandler, you know, one of their famous things in the Acts 29 church is like a counterculture. N now I know what those terms mean. And right. Going there as a Christian in the moment, you know, I didn't know that, but it was like building, building, building. Like you said, 2020 happened. That was like their go time. Like this is like the pinnacle. Right. Things are hot. Like this is our chance. Like let's jump on it. And, and that's what they did. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. You um, I just talk about that because that's what your your blue book talks about more so like the yeah. history of it, because I was I was surprised to learn that this this went all the way back in the 70s, like, you know, with uh, Lausanne. Am I saying that right? The Lausanne Covenant? Lausanne. Yeah. Uh, Lausanne Covenant. And I was shocked to, you know, to know that they were planning this for years. Like here it is, you know, brothers, like, you know, you know, the floodgates open. You know, let's do our job. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Lausanne is I mean, if you look at them now, they're. um they're even further, I think, to the left. They're like environmental justice type people. Uh, you have because they still meet. They still have conferences. Um, the Chicago declarations, the big uh, statement, too. And then you had um, evangelicals. I think they called themselves for Jimmy Carter or no, no. What was it? It was 
Now I'm forgetting. It's been a little while <laughs> since I've done that research. Read your book had, again. For McGovern. Yeah, they had evangelicals for McGovern. And you had some SDS guys like uh, Richard Mao and um, Jim Wallace and Ron Sider, who he wasn't SDS, but he was. Uh, I mean, he's basically more at this time. He's and, and I, I would say throughout his whole entire life, he's basically Marxist. He would try to deny that, but it's basically what he he was was a kind of a, a he was very soft on on Marxism and, and advocated aspects of it. And um, guys like that came together for a political purpose, and it turned into let's craft a statement, the Chicago Declaration. Uh, and then you had globally the Lausanne Covenant that was um, happening at the same time. That was, I think, 74. Chicago Declaration was 73. Mm -hmm. Even Juggles from McGovern, 72. And, um, and, and they kind of fracture. They kind of like uh, w when Jimmy Carter's presidency kind of fails and they, fa they, they kind of failed to get the formula right. They, this is actually one of the things Gospel Coalition has succeeded at that they failed at because in the 70s they they didn't they were very esoteric theoretical with they didn't really have um like literature like like some of their magazines like um sojourners magazine i think it was called the post american at first yeah was if you read the old articles it's very political but a lot of these Christians, you know, they're wanting to know, like, how do I, should I discipline my kids? How do I do it? Uh, what do I do about um, this latest fad that I'm not sure if it's okay or not? You know, these are qu practical questions and they didn't really get into that stuff. And so you didn't have the support of the masses, really. It was some kind of political nerd types that were into this. Well, Gospel Coalition and, and, and some of the modern organizations that are pushing left they have the formula down better because what they're doing is they're giving uh, a lot of like answers to practical questions. They're targeting laymen. They're targeting people like normal working class type people, especially I, I would say it's the suburban housewife that they target Yeah, that's true. For, for their material. That's the demographic, yep. not the college professor, right? Which is what a lot of those guys in the seventies appealed to. And that has made a huge difference. The suburban housewife, I think, um, has been targeted to and, and probably influenced more than any other demographic to in, in the sense that um, they've they've had a lot of influence in churches and that influences uh, come come through this formula. So, yeah, I mean, the history is fascinating, but um, it's. It's also a bit depressing, I suppose, because, <laughs> you know, you think, oh, they went away and you had the religious right and you had Ronald Reagan and then but they come back and they come back because they never actually went away from the academy. And it was in those more intellectual circles that some of these current the current crop of evangelical influencers were nurtured and then they were able to market it to a mass audience. I think it's, so. a, you know, it, it could be encouraging in a sense, you, you know, maybe that sounds weird, but that you're looking at the history is like seeing the work that they did to get here. That's encouraging for us as Christians. Okay. If we put in the work, you know, oh, sure, really, yeah. we can turn the tide back because they, they put the work in, you know, and are, are we working? And if we do, we can guarantee it. Like, you know, uh, if, if you, sh you know, he was so <laughs> sparingly will reap, you know, willingly, or if I'm, I'm paraphrasing that, but the idea is get to work now. And you'll see the fruit of your labor down the road. And you can be sure of that. Lord. Again, Absolutely. Lord willing, God, by God's grace. Yeah. I've said we need a parallel like to yeah. the gospel coalition for a long time. Cause none of these other organizations, G3, grace to you, um, Ligonier and any of the more uh, p organizations seen as conservative evangelical, they can put out some good articles on some things, but they tend to be more theological. They tend to um, be more, uh, you know, script scripture exegesis, which is good. Right. Yeah. Um, but we have an option between that and then discernment ministries really on our side, uh, quote unquote, discernment ministries. So pe yeah. people even like myself who we're critiquing the other side, but what positive material are, are we putting out there? And so, you know, that's actually one of the things I'm working on this year is trying to I actually was uh, emailing a guy today to do some uh, website development to see if there's an option here to create something that would compete with organizations like Gospel Coalition to give a very positive vision, target 
um, and I wouldn't target the suburban housewife necessarily, but I would, you know, families in general, working class people and um, give them just really practical stuff from the Bible um, <clears throat> and current stuff, relevant stuff. And um, I, I think that's that's a formula that seems to have um, been helpful in influencing people. And so we, we need that and about 100 other things. Right. We need all hands on deck right now. And uh, and so there are some positive things happening, like uh, I like American Reformers, a very new platform that's to, that's been created by um, Nate Fisher. And that's doing some good work. And I, I'm excited to see where they go. But, um, you know, we'll see the Lord's in control. Ultimately, we'll see what he does and just trust him that he knows what he's doing. And if he wants to judge the United States and, and the church here, then that's up to him. If he wants to form a revival and bring people back to him, that's up to him too. And we just, um, it's a hard thing sometimes, but we have to actually trust him in that and know that his ways are better than ours. Amen. And, and speaking of that, you know, where, you know, where would you say that the state of the, you know, the church is not, you know, you know, nowadays, like, do you think it's maybe gotten a little bit more aware of these things and a little bit more, uh, awaken, not awoken, not, not right. woke, but awaken. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> people, every, since 2020, everyone thinks they know kind of what, what the social justice stuff is about. Right. So, um, whether they can recognize the subtle shifts in their church is another question, but churches have split up. I don't know what the problem is. They haven't really done studies on this. Hmm. Uh, and you know, I was just looking a few months ago for studies and there, there aren't any, there's some indicators things like pastors are at it's an all-time high for pastors quitting ministry well that's an indicator that there's something going on right yeah um there's uh indications that of the people who left in 2020 uh, when the church is shut down who weren't going to church of those people only like two-thirds returned like there's there's things like this that indicate that something's going on because you know a lot of people's experience was the church got shut down for COVID. We went home and then all of a sudden we turn it on the next week and pastor has, uh, you know, two, two uh, people from the church who are minorities lecturing everyone else on their privilege. Oh. And, and so, and then they're frustrated because they're not even at church. And so they lose connection. And right now I would say where the deck is still being reshuffled, but a lot of reshuffling has already taken place and the dust is settling. And, I, I would just say we're very, very fractured right now. There's some super solid churches out there. Some of them have gained a lot of people because of what happened in 2020. Um, I've spoken at some of them, but, uh, you know, in other areas, like in the area that I live, <clears throat> I have a very secular area. Uh, I would say that most, like a lot of the churches capitulated on this. And I probably go to one of the few churches in the region that, um, is strong on this issue and mm -hmm. it's a smaller church. I mean, it gained a few people because of all that stuff, but there aren't really a lot of churches that are, I would say solid on this. Oh, so true. <clears throat> so, and I, and where you live, I'm sure it's the same you, cause you're uh, coming from New Jersey. So. Oh my goodness. Um, I just had a pastor <clears throat> gone, uh, not had, I heard a pastor at, at a popular church named liquid church. His pastor, his, his pastor name is Tim Lucas. I'm familiar. <laughs> And, and I, and I was, I, I was getting livid. Like, you know, I was, you know, I was talking to my wife, but like I was just getting livid. And he says, if, uh, to have a relationship with God, you got to have a relationship with the poor. And he was just preaching from Isaiah 58 and you know, oh, yeah, it, just, it just works. It was just no, no, totally what the Bible says. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, <laughs> and I'm thinking like, you know, how, how are these people, like, what are the people in the pews doing? Like, you know, I would have been sit, standing up and like, you know, like speaking out against <laughs> getting get kicked out. Like I, yeah, you know, I just can't, I can't believe my ears. Of right. what's going on and, and again this is you know he said like this is in the secular era this is new jersey for us this is it's it's in a dire dire state right now and it's sad yeah well i mean you think about it that works appeal to people so whether it was don't play cards and drink and don't uh you know i don't know smoke or whatever mm -hmm. you know as long as people didn't do that and they didn't get tattoos they felt like well you know i'm pretty holy i'm pretty a good person here and it's the same thing with this you're like well look i'm I, I care about the poor. I believe in equity. I mean, this is even lazier in, in a way because for a lot of people, they think that they can just send out a tweet. They can just virtue signal. And that's <laughs> the same as doing something for the poor. So as long as they have the right opinions on something, they're good people. And then it gives them a 
bat so they can go hit everyone who fails to meet that threshold. And that's it makes us feel good about ourselves. That's why people do it. <laughs> and like you said, like so. it targets the girls because, you know, women are naturally are nurturers. So it's like, you know, bingo. Of course you want to help the poor. And it, it's playing on your emotions. It's like, you know, don't you want to help the poor again? Of course I want to help the poor. But to say that this is the gospel, yeah. again, to quote Tim Lucas, if you don't do this, you don't have a relationship with God. Like that's that's heresy. That That is another religion over here that we're being taught. Yeah. I mean, if you said something like, you know, we uh, should give all our money to help all the stray dogs and cats of the world, right? You'd be like, well, that's ridiculous, right? We have to feed our families. We have other, But in these circumstances... I'm, I'm, no one would say that, but I'm, I'm using a ridiculous circumstance. <laughs> if someone objected, right, we, we and and then someone were to say, well, what do you don't care about dogs? You don't care about cats? You know, that's <laughs> that would be we, we could see that as a silly reaction in that context. But when we say it about um, other causes that are popular, then, you know, you're, you people look at you sometimes like, well, what do you not? You don't care about racism. Like you, you don't care about how the way women are treated. Like what are those people? Huh? You, oh, my gosh. You know, how, how can you say that? You know, and it's like it's like, no, I, I care. That's not the issue here. Like, of course, I care about these things. What I'm saying is that's not the gospel. And also, um, you know, that's not something that uh, it, it doesn't rise to the level of importance to usurp everything else. It's not like an all encompassing thing that it's not the only issue that's out there yep. that God wants us to care about. So it's um, there, there's a legalism here that, uh, you know, at, on its best day, someone who says the Lord wants me to go help in this particular arena, let's just give all the legitis legitimacy in the world to that person and say their motives are right and they're doing the right thing to impose it on everyone else. You have legalism. Right? Yeah. And so that's unfortunately what we have. Yeah. It's a place to burden on you and say with that word do right. Like do justice, do social justice. Well, bingo works. Ding, ding, ding. There we go. Yeah. Well, and, and we are supposed to, you know, broadly speaking, we are supposed to do justice. We're supposed to treat yeah. now. What that means is treat people with equity, treat people, um, as equal according to a, a just standard. So God is just, that's one of his attributes. Um, so this is um, part of the law that we as believers use as a guide to for how we live. But when you get into like specific um, supposed applications, most of the time they're not even applications of that. Yeah. They're, they're, they're actually distortions. But you know, when you get into these supposed applications and people say, well, you, you, you didn't march with BLM. I guess you're not as good of a person or they give you that impression. It's like, well, even if that's a good thing, which I don't grant, <laughs> I think it's a bad thing. But even if it's a good thing, that's that's your thing, right? That doesn't have to be. The Bible doesn't say that's everyone's thing. Mm -hmm. And and that's no better than the legalists that most of these social justice types criticize. Like the they hate like pharisaical legalist religion, but then they act that way times 10. And uh, I've never felt as unwelcome or seen as much vitriol and hatred as I have, I think, from, um, unfortunately, from people claiming to be Christians who are deep into the social justice stuff. Yeah. They have been some of the most wretched, like, just not nice to be around people I think I've ever seen in my life. You, yeah, you'll get pushback really fast and, and you'll see that this, again, like you said, it's, it, it is a different religion and you'll see that real fast the moment you disagree with them. That's it. It's, you know, like, like you're, you, you're in the ring and get ready to tussle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, it's totally true. And, and I wonder, you know, if love is the thing that marks Christians love for one another, by the way, it's not love as in this, as this like heavenly latte, just lo love for each other as Christians. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Um, I wonder sometimes about, like how actually big or small the church really is the true believers. And it's not because I'm saying that they the love is a basis for their salvation. I'm saying that love is the, um, is the Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandments, loving Jesus, uh, reacting to the gospel in a way, in, in a, um, a thankful way. And trying to follow God's command to love others is a fruit of, of that relationship that we have with God. And, and that's like the fundamental thing that marks a Christian more than anything else. It's not even 
um, it's not even helping the poor. <laughs> That's not as fundamental as loving yeah. one another. Yep. And so that's the thing that I find most lacking from many of the social justice warriors I've interacted with who claim to be Christians uh, online. And, you know, even when I was um, in seminary and, and at uh, university, mm -hmm. Christian university, uh, it's, it's unbelievable how intolerant they are. Yeah. So it's, it's hypocrisy. Yeah. It's kind of gives you a clue to maybe where they're actually at. Definitely. How, um, how, um, how, how do you think that we can be aware of like pastors and churches who, who hold to this? Maybe, you know, we're trying to find another church and, you know, maybe we are just for the first time trying to see, you know, see, seeing things like, okay, this is different. <laughs> we're trying to, you know, uh, filter and figure out who's who and where they stand. Like, like right. what are the telltale signs that we can look out for? You think? Well, hmm. yeah. So there's a, there, there, there's a number of things, I suppose. Um, I mean, I would say if, I mean, if you walk in and there's a woman pastor walk out, right? That's <laughs> yeah. right. If it's a, Immediately. <laughs> if it's a denomination that believes that women pastors are wrong, but yet there's someone up there who's doing it. If they, um, you can see it, I think primarily in, in the way that they handle, uh, fundamental teaching on gender and roles in marriage and in society see the the kind of um ways in which they they platform women in their churches and whether or not it conforms to a biblical standard uh see uh, look at whether or not they avoid certain passages or try to neutralize certain passages that talk about sins that are popular in the world like homosexuality for instance mm -hmm. and th that can really i think clue you in um if there's certain sins that will never be mentioned you know that's a problem if you never hear the gospel clearly articulated that's a problem yeah um if on the racial justice stuff i guess you know they're or the anti-white racism i should say if they are guilting you for some kind of a privilege or they or there's an assumption that you can't even question the perspective of someone who's a minority because they're oppressed that's their bible they're opening they're they're telling you that that's an infallible standard that you you can't question so you know run for your life in that kind of stuff um if they platform voices that are known like, and, and I mean, known commodities, like if, uh, if Russell Moore, you know, or Tim Keller material is being used, that's something to ask them about. Oh yeah. Be because you know, these guys, it's not like they had a one-off uh, and they were <laughs> an error. Like they, they have consistently been an error. And most of the people who follow their work closely are also going to be on that social justice side of things. And so you, you want to look at the material that's being used at the church too. And, and just see, um, I mean, if, and I could give you a whole list of names on that, I'm sure. But I, those are two very recognizable ones. Uh, so, I mean, these are just some of the things. I'm sure there's more if I thought about it. But, um, yeah, it, it's, like I said, a lot of it's going to be subtle things. There, It's funny. There was a situation oh, okay, at my yeah. own church like a, a months ago. There was a guy who, who was like a missionary coming through, and, and he gave a sermon, and I listen to it and i could not quite even put my finger on it and of course i read these guys all the time i just knew that he sounded an awful lot like a lot of the woke guys that i've read i've read a lot of woke guys so i uh i i went on his social media and sure enough the guy's you know woke he's got <laughs> all these posts and i was like oh you know and I couldn't have even told you what it was that made me just think this guy's woke exactly other than i've I, I, I just have learned to recognize it, I suppose. But there are certain um, there's certain phrases and just emphases that they have and uh, sins that they like to beat up on and then sins they like to excuse. Yeah. You know, if, if your pastor is always beaten up on racists, but he can never like and you don't even know who they are in your church. Right. <laughs> but he can't address the sin that's actually present there. Like, you know, you have a woke pastor who's not doing his job. Or those pesky Christian nationalists <clears throat> that nobody knows who they are, but they're, they're you know they're in the pews apparently because they talk about it all the time. 
Yeah, they're very imprecise with what they mean when they criticize uh, sometimes. I wanted to hear uh, hear your thoughts on this because um, you know me do my personal study. Um, I kind of tried to, to narrow it down to two two teachings, and and just straight up asking the pastors and teachers. So you know, just to hear your thoughts. Um, I asked them, "What do you believe on white privilege and systemic racism?" Because I tend oh, to yeah. find those two as the most forming in your theology, and they'll they'll, they'll consume the gospel and, and they'll replace total depravity, original sin. So now, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So now, you know, because if you switch the the problem with mankind, that will determine the solution. So if you believe this is the problem, social justice good is point. the solution. So I'm excellent. Not, yes, wanted to hear, you know, what your thoughts on that were. That's an, that's a really excellent point, actually. Um, and you're probably right about that. That probably is the main thing that would, or the most identifiable thing they would easily grant you. Because if you bring up roles of women or something generally the shift is happening in the church but they know like they have a doctrinal statement to fall back on to they don't think that they're risking much by uh, telling you that they believe in systemic racism usually like that's not a big like uh there's not like a lot of red flags there for them so you know if they if you buy into uh, i think what you just said the problems generally that dictates the solution so if, yeah. if the problem is disparities that exist, then the solutions are going to be redistribution, right? Yep. Uh, so like it, it, it might be redistribution of privilege. It might be redistribution of platforming. It might be diversifying your elder board or your theological library. It might be changing in some of the art. It might be diversifying your music at the church. Like there could be a lot of ways in which they, they're doing this reallocation in their mind. And, um, and so it's not biblical, obviously, though. That's not you're not going to find that in scripture anywhere that we have to that. It, first of all, that a disparity must necessarily be addressed or that it's a bad thing. And then secondly, that the way we address it is by taking uh, by cutting other people's cultures down or taking their money, you know, things like this. So, yeah, that that's like a, a classic social justice worldly social justice logic being applied and uh i think you're spot on in noticing that um and, and you know once they say that they believe in that stuff then i mean i think that's it yeah for me i i, I wouldn't go to which if, if the pastor said i believe in systemic racism after 2020 right knowing yep. all of what the because because the waters were so muddied but now, now we know, like, you, there's no excuse. Hindsight <laughs> now, 2020, no pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's like, you know, you're, if you're that, um, if, if what you meant by it wasn't what everyone else means by it, then you are so unfortunately inept, <laughs> culturally inept uh, to the point that you shouldn't probably be a pastor because you have to lead people who live in this world. And so, yeah. um, yeah, I would say if a pastor adopts that that kind of language or believes in white privilege, I just I wouldn't even bother with it at that point. And, that, and that's this is me after years. You know, initially I think I would have said, "Well, let's have a discussion. Let's yeah, let's tease talk. this out." And I've just seen that go um, poorly so many times. And I I have yet to find someone who actually believes that like change. I mean, there are people who change their position, but like um like. I, there's there's not like an innocent way like sometimes people will say like oh i believe in that but it's not what you think i'm not with blm or whatever but then later on down the road you find out no it is what you meant <laughs> like yeah <laughs> so you deceived me yeah <clears throat> taking off the mask because and and all and you know add too if if you ask your pastor that and he gives you anything but like uh, a no question because my last pastor i asked him that and i would just get word salads yeah and, you exactly know, I, I tried to stay and I did, you know, I didn't want to just leave right away. You know, I want to try to, you know, seek reformation. If not, you separate, you know, you seek separation, but it, again, it was just word salads. And then I went to another church, asked him the same question. And his response was absolutely not. So I think, you know, that's, a, can, you know, be a good way to, you know, for our audience, if you want to find a good church and find out where they stand, you can ask them those two questions. And if, they, and if they give you word salads, leave, but if they say, you know, clear, direct, absolutely not, or anything like that, you probably had a good church or you're at a better church than those other people. Oh yeah. Yeah. Pastor who doesn't know what he believes is not a good pastor. <laughs> yeah. What, um, you know, just give us some application. What, what, do you, what can we do as Christians to help fight against social justice? 
Yeah, I mean, it depends what you're, you got to evaluate your platform first and what kind of influence you have. And, you know, if you're a 14 year old, your job is to study and study well and prepare yourself for life, right? You're not going to be probably doing a lot of street fighting on social justice. <laughs> but if you're older um, and you have a platform, you're working at a university or you're working, I don't know, in a church or wherever, um, and, it, and if the Lord has blessed you with some kind of, uh, um, you know, ability to communicate, you know, you may have a greater responsibility at that point for calling it out. Uh, we all have influence at, at the very least with the people who we live with, our families, friends mm -hmm. who are close to us. And, and so that's that's everyone. And so we do have, I think, um, an ability there to talk to people that recommend good resources. I mean, it's one of the reasons I wrote Christian Social Justice and I put a at worldviewconversation.com, a study guide up there for free because I want wow. people to sit around and talk through these things. Mm. And so, um, so you you could even use a tool like that. You could, yeah. um, no. you could volunteer your time for, uh, I, I, I would say, uh, causes that, um, you know, whether, and this is, this isn't within the context of a church necessarily, it could be, but uh, social uh, causes that try to um, identify and then answer, refute social justice, whether that's a local political campaign or a, uh, or if it's in your church, you could offer, I want to do a Sunday school class on this topic. Um, I want to go and, um, you know, to the local town board meeting or the school board meeting. And I want to let them know how I feel about the you know, LGBT books that they're pushing at the, we've had this, you know, at my church, yeah. uh, people go to the like local town or a school board meeting to, um, oppose w what the school's doing and oh, stuff. Good. So, I mean, there's all kinds of things you can do. Sky's the limit, but, um, you just have to take inventory. I think of the, of human scale, like what you only have limited time. So what can you do with that time? And for some people it might be, I just need to train my kids well, cause that's all I have time for. <laughs> Yeah, we're, yeah, it's 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 the uh, the true version of creating counterculture, I guess, <laughs> uh, yeah. or raising a counterculture. <laughs> yeah, that's that's your ministry primarily. Yeah, definitely. And then uh, you know, before we go to, um, how can people support you and your ministry? Uh, you can go to um, worldviewconversation.com, and there's a support tab there. I'm on Patreon. I'm on. Um, I mean, there's, a, I think I have a PayPal link and a Bitcoin link or something. If people want to financially give, uh, they can just pray for me. That's a big thing. Definitely. Uh, I, I know pretty soon, actually, I better hold on this announcement. <laughs> uh oh, okay. um, I'll have a give, send, go up at, at some point for an, a gospel coalition alternative probably, but um, oh, I don't nice. have it up yet. But yeah, you can go to my website, worldviewconversation.com. There's a support tab. Okay. And, and then you're still going around maybe from church to church doing conferences like that? Well, I do speak at times. Yeah, I, I spoke a lot this last year, so I don't know if I'll do as much this year, but um, <laughs> it's already starting. My calendar is already starting to fill up a little, so I guess yeah. I am going to do some of it. Um, so I don't have like a lot of dates planned, but I I do have like talks I'm, I'm, I am in with people. And um, when the dates do become publicly available, they'll be at worldviewconversation.com as well. Okay, perfect. All right. Yeah. yeah. So we'll keep, yeah, you know, keep you in prayer. Definitely. You know, we'll do our best to, to, uh, you know, support you, you know, in uh, every way we can. And, and, you know, again, you know, thank you for all that you do and, and have done, you know, cause you helped me out and I know you helped a bunch of other people out too on this issue. Cause you're one of the few who are, you know, you know, actively trying to, again, let people know what's going on, try to fight against what's, what's being taught in these churches and seminaries, like you said. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you, Lucas. And, uh, you know, thank you for trying to get the word out there. I mean, you're doing one of the things that can be done. You're trying to get um, good information in the hands of people that you care about. So, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, and if you can, you know, subscribe to Method Ministries and subscribe to Worldview, com or, I'm sorry, Conversations That Matter. Oh, on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Rumble, too. Don't forget Rumble. <laughs> and Rumble. And yeah, I'm on Facebook and uh, Gab and uh, and actually Truth Social. But yeah, I'm not there as much. <laughs> Same. Yeah, I got an account, but I just, uh, yeah, I'm not there yet either. <laughs> there. You kind of go there to see what Trump's saying, maybe. <laughs> yeah. and, and, you know, that's so. And um, any final words of encouragement for us or anything you want to leave us with? Look, the Lord uh, knows the end from the beginning. There are 7,000 who haven't bowed the knee to bail. And Amen. you might feel alone where you're at, but you're not alone. 
God is still with you. And there are people, I'm sure even in your community who see some of the things you're seeing. And um, if you can't find a good church uh, and if, you know, if you can't move, because that would be one of your options, then maybe the Lord wants you to start something or to meet with a church plan or a body of believers. I'm sure there's other people who feel similarly. So find your group, find your people. This is happening all over the place already. And, um, and then just, you know, do, do the things the Lord has commanded you to do and live your life. We're only here for a breath. So, um, for the time that you're here on this earth, um, you know, the, as Ecclesiastes says, obey God and keep his commandments and, uh, nothing's changed in that regard. And the social justice movement and, and really any political movement has no authority and, and no ability to change the things that to, to usurp God's plan. Right. So you just keep seeking his kingdom and righteousness and he will take care of you and see you through even hard times. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. True. True justice was was found and is found in the cross of Christ. And that's and that's the justice that God God offers by faith alone. So uh, that was John Harris again. Thank you, John. And uh, yeah, my pleasure, yeah. Lucas. God bless you. Yeah, God bless you too. Take care.